All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Countless Vlogcast, episode 42. My guest today is the mental health specialist and doctor. I'm going to bring you in. This is the first episode of the Countless Vlogcast. We're talking about mental health. So I hope you guys enjoy this and hope you guys get something out of it too. So um, enjoy, guys. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. Tell, tell us a little about yourself. Hey, my name is Dr. Olivia Ormahara Williams. I am a licensed professional counselor in the state of Georgia, a national certified counselor, and I also have my PhD um, in counselor education. And as far as my master's is in counselor uh, counseling, but specifically focused on uh, clinical mental health because there's different tracks you can go in uh, in regards to counseling. I have been a practicing clinician for almost a decade. Um, and with my PhD, I also transitioned to working in academia. So I'm actually an assistant professor at, at the University of West Georgia. So I've been in academia for five years. And so I kind of moved between the two worlds as far as like the clinical world, but also the uh, academic world as far as contributing on the research piece of things. Um, I live in Atlanta, been here for over almost five years, actually, moved here in 2015. I <laughs> uh, live here with my husband and our uh, wonderful, beautiful, energetic uh, two and a half year old daughter, Madeline. <laughs> okay, great. So as a mental health professional, how is going to therapy helped you out? So for me, it's a space for me to go to um, us as professionals, even though we have the knowledge, it's great to have somebody that can hold you accountable, right? So I have personal and professional goals that I set for myself. So to have somebody to be able to go to, to work through that. Um, and we also have, we still experience real life, regular life um, stressors. And so it's always good to be able to take off my professional hat and go to somebody else to help me work through uh, some of the issues. Because um, similar to other fields, I feel like we tend to keep our counselor hat on a lot, even when we're dealing with relatively challenging situations within our own personal lives. So it's great to have a space where I can go to and completely just be me, uh, not me, the professional, the, the professor, um, the counselor, just Olivia, and I can just go and decompress. So that's, um, and it's actually highly recommended within our field to have our own um, counseling going on because some of us work uh, in very, with very challenging populations. And so to help us manage the stressors of our job requirements and make sure that we're okay and to minimize um, burnout, it's highly recommended that we have our own counseling. Okay, great. So with your experience, um, why would you recommend, why and what would you recommend for therapy for people that like are like still like on the fence about going to therapy and where, where should they start? So therapy, really, people should look at it as a space to go to, to be able to just work through life. It's not always about very complex situations. So I think we sometimes have the misconception that I only need to go to therapy if I'm working through um, like a traumatic event or grief. It, it could be because you're um, working through relationship issues and just needing somebody to help you work through complex emotions uh, learn new coping skills, um, job, you know, career paths, you know, there's, you can go in to, to work through that. So really anything in life where you feel like you need that additional, um, support that can be there. You can be starting there. So, um, any range from very complex situations or traumatic pain or loss to, something as uh, light as you're just trying to make sense of life, right? You're overwhelmed. You just need to unpack. Those are all reasons why you can go to counseling. We don't have to wait until things are at their absolute worst for, uh, for you to feel the need to seek counseling. You can go for something that's that you feel is relatively light and have somebody to help you work through uh, those complex emotions and decision making. Okay, great. So um, what are some of the issues you find in the Black community that need to be addressed? Uh, stress. Um, so unfortunately, I would say that we as a people, Black people in this country, we have unfortunately have had to deal with a lot 
And so we have normalized being overwhelmed and emotionally drained. Um, and so most of my black clients that come through, they are overwhelmed on every front. So home, um, school, work, just completely tapped out. Uh, other issues that I've seen unresolved um, familial issues, and this could be things that's happened in the past or are currently happening, uh, which goes along with setting boundaries. And part of it is just how, as a community, we've vibed for so long. Uh, so like creating and maintaining healthy boundaries, uh, child and parent relationships, that's a big factor, uh, especially when you're talking about uh, adolescents, teenagers and parents, that there's a, there tends to be a lot of things happening there. And also just relationship issues. And it's not just about uh, intimate, re intimate partner relationship, romantic relationships, but it's also like um, sibling relationships, familiar relationships, friendships. So a lot of uh, different stresses that come with people needing help to navigate those uh, close relationships and stress to uh, related with work, which, which tends to sometimes have some underlining theme of um, discrimination, racism, um, just a lot of just things that we as black people tend to be subjected to in the workplace. Um, that tends to be a theme too, when I'm working with uh, specifically black clients. Okay, great. So with problems come solutions. So what are some coping mechanisms and solutions you, um, you recommend to like your clients and people out there that are just like watching? Yeah. So the beginning, I was something that's relatively easy is unplugging. I know, especially right now we are over consuming for me, honestly, uh, media and social media, there's a lot going on in the world. And with COVID-19 happening, we're limited on the things that we can do. So typically we could go out, be doing different things, whether it's hanging out with friends, just being out and about, but now we're kind of confined to our home spaces. And so we are in our phones, in our tablets, watching the news, you know, kind of constantly. And so just simply unplugging. Um, so you could just, if you can, you, you might want to start smart, maybe just like a couple of like limiting yourself to maybe half of a day to working your way up to a day or maybe even two where you can just disconnect and not allow yourself to continue to consume a lot of the content that's coming in because it can be overwhelming, especially for us in the black community, because not only are we dealing with COVID, but we're also dealing with all the racial tension that's going on. Uh, so unplugging is really good uh, and making it a habit, being intentional. So a lot of people struggle with being consistent in implementing their coping mechanisms just because they're not intentional. And so you can have things that you do to unwind, but you kind of do it if and when you kind of find time versus making it a part of your schedule. And so mm -hmm. if part of what you like to do is, for example, uh, my people who like to work out, right? If physical activity is a thing that helps you unwind and decompress, put it on your calendar, you know, put it as part of your calendar. If it's working out three times or going to do yoga or walking, put it, put a specific time on your calendar. So that mm -hmm. way you have your, we all have our phones, <laughs> your reminder comes up and be like, Oh, I have to go to the gym, you know, for the next two hours and work out. And so that way it's part of your calendar and it holds you to so find a way to hold yourself accountable. Uh, other things, um, it's a practice called be, like mindfulness. And that simply means being present in the moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of us either live in the past or the future. I Many we're obsessed with things that's past and we can't do anything about it. Or we're so fixated with the future that we're uh, not really paying attention to what's going on now. So if we practice being mindful and being present, that's helpful. Uh, and it also helps with relationships, right? So something as simple as uh, fixing a meal really taking your time, you know, mm -hmm. how do they, as you're watching the ingredients or cooking, like take the time to smell and, and feel the texture and look at the different colors of the food that you're putting together. When you're walking outside, you know, take a, you know, how many birds did you notice? How many dogs did you notice? How many 
um, houses did you pass? How many cars passed you? So that way you're really in the moment and that takes you out of your head and that allows you to take your mind off of some of the stressors that we experience. So really um, intentionality and being present can go a long way when it comes to um, those coping mechanisms. Great. So it's a tough question. Um, like, how do you how do you help patients deal with like race and racism? Racism. So I think for me, especially being a black woman, um, them knowing that they come into the space and they can just be themselves. They don't have to worry about filtering. They can just be as raw and as real as they need to be. And so a lot of my clients that actually all of my black clients right now, that's been a theme of um, a lot of our discussions. So they're able to come and just unwind and unpack and they know they're in a safe, supportive environment where they can process those emotions. And so a lot of the things that we that I'm able to do with my clients is to one, validate their experiences um, and allow them that space to just vent. You know, sometimes a lot of us just need to be in a safe space where we know we can vent without anybody judging us, without anybody, you know, trying to tell us what to do. But we just want to get these things uh, off of our chest and allow be allow a space to be able to um, express these complex emotions. And so I've been able to do that with a lot of my clients. And then after we have that moment of um, venting and just kind of letting that uh, those emotions and those thoughts come out, then we start working on game plans. You know, the next thing I want, I ask them, I'm like, okay, so what do you want to do now? Since we've kind of gotten these thoughts out, we've kind of gotten this, um, these feelings out, what, do, how do you want to move forward? What, what do you want to focus on that can help you better deal with upcoming situations? Okay, great. So another question for you. Um, for people out there that want to get like therapy in this this like time with quarantine and not being able to go like physically get um, therapy and like talk to somebody, what do you recommend for them? What are like some like um, great resources? So right now, telemental health, which is based all it means is uh, being able to engage in therapy uh, from a distance, and so whether it's video conferencing or by phone, all clinicians are pretty much uh, providing that that option, and so. That should not be an issue. Now, if you're in a relatively small town, it might be um, different. But those of us who are in relatively larger cities where tech and things like that is uh, relatively um, used in a lot, advanced technology is used in a lot of the um, community agencies and hospitals and private practices, being able to have um, counseling sessions either by video conference or by phone is what the majority of us are doing. And so that really shouldn't be um, difficult to find, but there's also a couple of apps that's recently come out. Uh, I'm not going to name them because I, I personally haven't tested them out. So I don't want to sit here and uh, drop names. And I really, I have no experience. I don't want to recommend yeah. anything that I haven't <laughs> used personally and professionally, but there are those options too. I know there's a lot of, um, there's a couple of um, apps that are coming out that's making um, access to their to licensed professional counselors a lot easier. But telemental help is a thing. Actually, when you when you go on on databases like Psychology Today or Counseling uh, Therapy for Black Girls, um, Black uh, Therapist Network, it will actually um, have like an asterisk next next to the clinician mm -hmm. to let you know if they provide telemental health services. And so, and that's something too, you can ask them when you when you initially contact the agency or the individual provider, if they're doing uh, telemental health. Okay, great. So another question, all this unemployment going on to like rising like by the week, um, mm -hmm. if somebody can like afford like therapy or like they can have like Wi-Fi or something like that too, or like, is it, is it, I guess they're free services though. Do you any like, I know it's, um, what do you recommend for them, people that can't afford? So I recommend people to reach out to um, the people in your area because we're actually highly encouraged as professionals to do some um, level of pro bono work. And so that could be an opportunity where somebody might have a spot or two open to be able to provide pro bono work to support you during that time. There's sliding scale, which essentially mean like the, the, the rate will be adjusted according to 
the client's uh, financial needs. And so I would encourage people to not allow money to be the thing that keeps them from seeking services because a lot of agencies and private practice and just individual clinicians uh, have systems put in place to accommodate for individuals who might be going through uh, financial hardship. And so I will just reach out and ask. The worst thing that they can say is no, but most of us have um, resources and references, uh, reference lists where we can provide those to you. I know here in Atlanta, there's, a, there's quite a few, few organizations that provide um, counseling services to, for little to nothing because their focus is on um, individuals who are, you know, who are coming from low socioeconomic statuses. So you might be able to um, find an agency that's allowing you to pay anywhere from like 10 to 15 to $20 a session, or even waive uh, fees for a certain period of time if they know that you're currently unemployed. And so I always encourage um, people in the community, reach out, worst case scenario, that particular person might not be able to work with you but more than likely they can provide you with resources within your community where um you can go and still um, get the services that you need great great so um in terms of um how has industry in, industry changed over the years like recent like um i guess from like 2010 to like now with the technology being so advanced um well progressively i'm really i'm a i'm a i'm not a full techie but i do really enjoy technology and so um, telemental health wasn't as um, accessible as it is now. And so given that pretty much all the hospitals and community agencies have the platform and the ability to do telemental health, that would not have been a thing 10, 15, 20 years ago. And so with us going through COVID right now, where you know, we had to be in, uh, in uh, quarantine and we couldn't meet clients face to face, we were able to still provide uh, counseling services to those who are in need and who really needed to maintain their um, the level of treatment that they were on. And so that has been the number one thing, the ability to uh, provide this distance counseling. But also I would say um, social media, like your platform, yes. there's a lot more discussions. Uh, you have so many uh, professionals who have, started using their social media platforms. So whether it's podcasts or social media uh, accounts like on Instagram and Twitter to talk about mental health more openly and more freely. Um, and that's helping with normalizing these discussions, which is helping dismantle some of the barriers and minimize the stigma around mental health. And so uh, we've also had you know quite a few celebrities and uh, athletes who are becoming vocal and so I would say technology has increased access and social media and the media is helping uh, push the conversation and normalizing um, discussions around mental health, which is in turn encouraging more people to seek uh, mental health services. Great. So after a session, um, what do you recommend some like a uh, person does after that so that they don't lose that like positivity and that um, encouragement? So. I tend to assign a, um, not a lot of homework, but there's always things that I have my clients do in between sessions to reinforce. And so really, when you think about the amount of time that you spend with your, um, your therapist, it might be anywhere from you know 50 to an hour, an hour and a half. And so you're usually, uh, depending who I'm working with, the, the conversations are going to look different. And so if I, we're actively working on maybe some new coping mechanisms, it would be me holding you accountable to implement it. So maybe we're going to do some sort of um, journaling or logging to make sure that you're tracking your intentionality in implementing some of the changes that we're, tr that we're focusing on. And so it really varies on, um, on what I tell a client to do between sessions because it's going to depend on what their treatment goals are. But the ultimate thing is that you have to incorporate the things that you're working on in, in the sessions because you are not, you're with your counselor for like this much time. <laughs> and so in between those sessions is where you have to incorporate the things that you're talking about and be intentional 
and implementing those things so that way you can start seeing the changes um, that you're discussing and working on between the sessions. And so um, all good therapists anyways and good counselors will have specific goals for you. And so uh, maybe one this week it might be one thing. The following uh, week might be, you know, two or three things on your being intentional with. So it really varies. But um, ultimately, remembering why you came to counseling um, is always a good way to keep you anchored and focused. Um, because we know the process of adjusting and changing can be difficult. And so if you remember the why that brought you to counseling, that would keep you motivated, even when you're feeling discouraged uh, in between those sessions. Okay, great. So um, as, as an experienced um, professional, do you have any advice for younger um, professionals out there that are looking to get this started? Yes, I would recommend, just like with any field, uh, find yourself a good mentor, right? So find somebody who is in kind of along the lines of what you want to do. So if you're interested in going into private practice, that would be a good thing, finding a person who's been successful in private practice and, you know, sit down, have conversations with them. Um, because I think everybody who, a lot of people who are interested in going to, into um, becoming therapists and counselors, ultimately they want to have a private practice, but it's beyond just working with clients. That piece requires you being business savvy. And so that's starting a whole business, running a whole business. And so if that's something you're interested, I would recommend that you find a mentor, somebody who's been successful in that area and, and pick their brain. So whether you want to do private practice or school counselor, uh, rehab counselor, marriage and family, really de regardless of which path you want to go, find somebody who's been in the game for at least, you know, I would say around a decade. That's a good amount of time to have had different one that would have been that would have been licensed and certified for a good amount of time, maintain their certifications and licensure. And they would have had a, a good amount of different experiences that they can um, speak to and help you preferably avoid some of the pitfalls that might have gone through. Um, another piece is starting to think about a niche, right? And so figure out what your specific focus is going to be the thing that's going to make you uh, unique and make you stand out. Uh, it doesn't have to be anything just outlandish, but having a specialty is always a great thing. Uh, for example, within our field, especially here in Georgia, there's not a lot of uh, certified play therapists. And so if that's something, if you're interested in working with young kids, maybe looking into play therapy in that process, because there is like almost... I was, I can probably count on both hands how many certified play therapists are in the state of uh, Georgia. And so if that's something that you're interested in uh, working with young children, maybe that's an area that you, you explore. Uh, so mentor niche and, and not being afraid to ask questions. You're not expected to know everything. And so be open to the process, be open to feedback and, and just pick people's brains, especially those who've been around for a while. We've, pretty much have experienced almost everything that you will. And so, you know, <laughs> learn from mm -hmm. us who've been in the field for a while. So maybe you can avoid some of the things that we've had to deal with. Um, so yeah, so kind of be proactive. Uh, I, I push mentorship in every field. And so having a good mentor can really help forge that professional path for you and allow you to get to those goals and meet those goals uh, a lot quicker than most. Okay, great. So wrapping it up, um... If we could talk about like me um, methods we can um, use besides work on police and mental health, like anything like moving forward, which is maybe a tough question. Oh, that is a tough question. <laughs> so I think part of um, the issue, similar to education, I feel like um, mental health workers, especially those who work in agencies, are overworked and underpaid. Um, a lot of the um, the cause or whatever that you see where you could have a crisis unit. I know some cities do, for some, apparently not every precinct have like crisis units that respond to individuals who are under like emotional distress. And 
So with this talk about defunding the police, if some of these funds can be reallocated towards those like crisis units and mental health um, services to uh, kind of like be proactive in addressing a lot of these issues that we see that could be of help. Um, I feel like it should be mandatory that police officers are um, have to go to counseling. <laughs> like, yeah. like not just when, I know there's instances where uh, when there's like something, it has to be like certain things that happen or they're um, made to go because of something that happened either in the field or with them personally. But I feel like it should be a standing practice. Just like uh, we, me as a professional, as a licensed professional counselor here in the state of Georgia, I have to complete certain amount of continued education units, meaning go to trainings or webinars or whatever, uh, what they're called CEUs. I have to accumulate a certain amount every year to maintain my licensure. And so to me, and the same thing with other professionals where you require your certification or license. And so to me, the same thing should happen with individuals who are literally walking around with a gun and have the ability to take mm -hmm. people's lives. And so if part of their continued training is not just about uh, handling weapons safely and de-escalating situations, but also checking to see mentally and emotionally uh, are these people currently fit to be in the field carrying around guns mm -hmm. and dealing with people in complex situations. So to me, there should be like a continuous evaluation of their mental and emotional state. And it should be done by individuals who are not part of the police department. So these should be people uh, that should contract out to like an agency or mm -hmm. uh, professionals like myself in a community that do not have, um, that can have like an unbiased perspective mm -hmm. and we just come in and there's a protocol and we evaluate them and we give them either, you know, we clear them or we don't. Um, and then the police department uses that um, feedback about, you know, if they need to go to additional training, do they need to take time off, whatever the decisions are. But I feel like that is part of it because when you see a lot of these discussions, people are talking about they're overwhelmed and mm -hmm. emotional they're checked out or even identifying some of the racial biases and some of the racist individuals, I feel like that will come up. <laughs> that will come up in this uh, in these counseling sessions if they were mandated to go through them regularly and not when there's an incident that happens. To me, that would be the government and the community being proactive versus reactive once something has happened. Yeah, it's just great to have it, have it in, out in the open, the conversation. They'll be truthful too, and, and be honest about it too, like one hundred percent honest about it too, like moving forward too. Exactly, and I feel like having somebody who's an outsider, who's not part of the police department, we would have an unbiased mm -hmm. opinion, and we're trained to, you know, recognize uh, patterns and identify when somebody's saying this honest and things like that. That we mm -hmm. can address those um, versus having somebody who's already internal to the police department where they might easily be influenced to, you know, report certain things mm -hmm. or minimize certain things or look at things as, you know, being um, part of the job or whatever uh, versus me as a professional coming in. I'm like, no, this, these are red flags. You mm -hmm. know, somebody shouldn't be feeling this way or thinking this way if they're going to be out in the community uh, handling mm -hmm. dangerous weapons and dealing with people Most every day. Definitely. Exactly. So, so um, final couple questions. What's the, mm -hmm. What is the new normal and what do you want to see moving forward in terms of mental oh. health in the world? The new normal. Uh, I'm still trying to figure that out. So right now, the more flexible we are with everything that's going on, I think that's going to help um, minimize the stress. I feel like we need to, for me personally and professionally, I think not being focused to honestly label what a new normal is and kind of taking it one day at a time. We know things might take a minute to transition to what we used to know, but we know that change is inevitable. So I think part of what's stressing a lot of us is being so fixated into the future where we're obsessively thinking, oh, what are would things ever go back to normal? Will we ever be able to do X, Y, and Z? And the the, the response to that is we don't know. And so instead of being so fixated on what might become the new normal, 
focused on what currently is. Uh, what are you? What are we currently able to do? What do we have um, going on right now that's within our control to help put energy into that versus being so fixated on what the quote unquote new normal will be? Mm -hmm. Because we have no way of knowing what that what that will be, whether it be a po positive thing, a negative thing. Uh, we really don't know. And so, kind of putting that energy into today and what is instead of what might potentially be. Um, and as far as the future of the mental health, I would say um, I would love to see two things um, happen in the new future. So not only more of us within the Black community really seeing the benefits of utilizing mental health services, but also seeing more young professionals and more young people coming into um, the mental health field because that's needed. A lot of people within our community hesitate to seek counseling because they're not seeing a lot of people who look like them providing the services. And so in addition to encouraging us to be open to seeking mental health services, I want to also see more people who look like me in my mm -hmm. classrooms, you know, coming into the profession uh, and getting their master's degree in, you know, in counseling, uh, whether you do clinical mental health or school or marriage and family, whichever is your interest. Uh, but there needs to be more of us because that is what's going to help um, by that's going to help normalize. So when you have somebody who goes to school for counseling, not their family, is engaging in that conversation. They're like, oh, my son, my nephew, my brother, my sister, whomever is current, you know, they're a therapist. So I have somebody whom I'm directly linked to. So that kind of demystifies uh, who are these therapist people and what they do. And so I think if we focus on both ends, not only encouraging people to come to seek counseling services, but also more young people to look mm -hmm. into becoming professionals within the mental health field that will help move us along and continue to destigmatize um, the mental health field overall. Okay, so final question. Um, not final question, but I like to end these with like a message, like positive message to the world out there. Anything you'd like to share? Okay. Uh, <laughs> no pressure. Oh, no, <laughs> no pressure. Just, you know, go to nugget. <laughs> um, let me see. I would say uh, be kind to yourself, right? I feel that we tend to be, we can be really hard on ourselves, especially with um, us being in quarantine. There was this uh, myth where people felt like, you know, you need to, you need to come out of quarantine, you know, with like five business plans and in the, in the best shape of your life and you're all mended all the relationships in your, you know, within your, your family and all of this. I'm like, no, sometimes we just need to, first thing we need to do is be kind to ourselves and be okay taking time for ourselves because everything that we talk about um, in regards to, even like the mental health field, the things that I can do as a professional, the things that I would like to see happen, how I would like to contribute, none of that is possible. Well, none of it's gonna be possible if I'm not taking care of myself. Mm -hmm. And so if we learn to be kind to ourselves and prioritize our wellness and to see it as a necessity and not a luxury or us being selfish, that's going to go a long way because that's going to feed into our mental and, and emotional well-being, which will feed into those relationships, which will feed into how we show up at work, how we show up in the community. So it really there's a trickle effect to it, but it all starts with us. So be kind to yourself, um, give yourself grace and really be intentional in taking care of yourself because... Mm -hmm. If you're not okay and things are not okay with you, you're not going to be able to show up in these different spaces uh, and be at your optimal because you're going to be lacking because of whether it's stress or being overwhelmed, whatever it might be. Um, so I would say that. <laughs> oh, that was great. Uh, thank you for coming on. So uh, just give us your uh, little like, tags and all a website so maybe people can find you and get advice from you and all that. Of course. Uh, you can find me on... Um, I'm on Instagram and Twitter 
and I'm think I'm having to think of it because I literally just started like really activating mm -hmm. my social media platform. Mm -hmm. And it's Dr. D R period O U W. And on there you have my link tree and it has like all my other things. So like psychology today and uh, if you want to contact me specifically for counseling services, go through my psychology today um, email. But if you're just trying to see, as far as like follow me to see what I post and different things like that, you can follow me on those social media platforms. And I'm also linked to a lot of other great uh, mental health platforms. So you can just go through my follows and kind of pick them out. But like Dr. Joy is kind of like probably <laughs> the biggest mm -hmm. A uh, mental health professional on Instagram. So she's always dropping very wonderful nuggets on there. She does a lot of Q and A's on her account all the time. And she just has a lot of great resources. Um, and so I will say, if you reach me on either into Instagram or Twitter, my link tree would take you to everything else um, linked to me on, on social media and the web. Okay. This has been uh, awesome. The first ever countless broadcast talking mental health. And things. It was great. Thank you, right. thank you, doctor, for coming thank on. Thank you so I much. I appreciate you. This thank you for having me, and thank no you for problema. furthering the conversation. This is needed, and so I'm always um, excited whenever I get invited to talk mm -hmm. about this topic. And so, thank you for making it a priority mm -hmm. for you and your uh, your your listeners and your followers. Mm -hmm. So, thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you for coming on. This has been the Countless Vlogcast with Dr. Olivia Omora Williams. Thank you for coming on. And have a good day. And everybody right. have peace and blessings. Bye. <laughs>